I've been looking forward to this edition of Lexington Remembers because it gives me a chance to to chat with an old friend and, and colleague uh, who's been meant so much to the town, means so much to the town, has done so much for Lexington and continues to, Narayan Bacha. Um, he uh, he uh, brings to our community a special kind of of background and uh, represents and, and leads a, a a growing community here uh, with an increasing participation in the life of, of this community. Um, how, how Ryan? How how did you happen to? come to Lexington and, and when did you come? Uh, we came here in 1966 uh, into America and uh, let me go back to a little bit of why I came to America, yeah, please. how I came and then I will continue with my story. Uh, I was born in Pakistan in uh, uh, before the partition took place in 1947. And uh, we were eight brothers and sisters, and my father was a pathologist, of chief, chief pathologist in Karachi Civil Hospital. And uh, so when partition was taking place, he was in a politically connected place because all the political murders, he had, had to come to him for force and mm -hmm. <laughs> determination of what, who really was killer, what happened. So they told them, that you got two actually uh, college going girls, you better leave because this is going to be a huge, huge uh, massacre. So. We left everything, and uh, we came in two different ways. You, you were Hindus, yeah. Muslims. Yeah, the Hindus had to leave because this became a Muslim country, and Muslims from India on the border they were also leaving. About ten million people moved, and uh, a lot of massacres. And we came. To, I remember coming to. Uh, Delhi airport, staying there, and uh, as a refugee, we had I had to stand up in a long queue for a cup of tea and a, and two slices of bread, and uh, so that was for a couple of months. Then we went to an old old relative's house in Bombay, and our family, my mother's sister's family, and. Uh, there was another friend of ours who had five children, their family, and the family we were living with. Together, we were 26 people living in one bedroom apartment without a bathroom. It was uh, a small place and we didn't have actually enough room to sleep. I used to tell uh, a friend of mine, my age, in, in the same room, uh, the family. I said, no, it's my time to sleep, your time to study. Mm. <laughs> so he'll say, okay, tonight I'll study and tomorrow you sleep, whatever. Well, it was a tough period and uh, my mother used to stitch uh, clothes. I would go and get the shirt and the cloth from the people and she would stitch them and then I would deliver it back to them. I used to, I was an entrepreneur from the beginning, I think. I, I would buy uh, ball pins in wholesale and buy about a dozen of them, um, or two dozen, and then I'd stand on the railway station and sell them. <laughs> How old were you then? <laughs> then? I was about uh, uh, nine, ten years old. Really? And uh, uh, so, but. Uh, we all educated each other, we then bought a place, uh, educated us each other, every one of us went to college, all of us. My father really never worked, he also had to leave everything there 
he came back here in accident. So then I started, uh, I, I went to college, did very well, an engineering college and I was employed as an engineer in an air conditioning and water cooler manufacturing company and I just was skyrocketing in terms of my promotions every three months and uh, uh, and then I changed the job and uh, I was in those days they say that you must substitute any every imported item because we don't have in India did not have any foreign exchange so then we were manufacturing furnaces with another company in collaboration with AFCO of England. And uh, so when I analyzed that, I found so many parts that I could make and that will save them a lot of foreign exchange and actually save them a lot of money. But little did I know that I rubbed somebody the wrong way because what they were doing is that they were buying those parts from England at an expensive price and all the extra money was going there to feed some directors who when they visited England. Ah, uh, okay. So they said, this guy knows too much. They fired me. And so you discovered there was a kickback here. Yeah. And, and then they fired me, so I was on the road. <laughs> And this was uh, like 1964, 65. And uh, so I said, okay, well, we ought to, I ought to do something. And uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, we were studying together in the evening classes, MBA. And there were th three other Is people. Is that where you met her? Yes. Yeah. She, she was the only girl in 125 boys. <laughs> Oh, really? So... That's tough competition tough for competition. you. Yeah. And we've been married ever since we got married, actually, in 65, a year after that. But anyway, at that time, uh, I saw her father. Her father was an architect, but a, a, an architect with a lot of innovation in her mind, in his mind. He just did all kinds of things. He, he created uh, methods of stopping river bank erosion and, and, uh, and created a, a hut which uh, was made from local materials for low cost housing where Jawaharlal Nehru, the then Prime Minister told him in the whole exhibition, please save this hut because we need it. He was very, very uh, innovation oriented. So he says, Narayan, you're a smart guy. And uh, this is Vidya's father. You know, yeah. In the, why don't you go to America? Uh, his son was already here in Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So this was in July of uh, uh, 1966. And in September, I was there and, and admitted in RPI. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And I, I came there and my, my first memory in my brother-in-law uh, I came from the, in New York. Apart from the big, huge buildings, he's taking me to Troy, New York, and uh, he's he's throwing money in the toll collection, you know, on the roads. I never forgot. They say, in this country, you throw money. <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> I never forgot that. I still remember throwing money, and I think we still throw money in many different ways. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I did very well in the college. I was on the top of the dean's list. This was at Rensselaer. Yeah, and I was doing uh, business management, mm -hmm. uh, but I was concentrating more on the quantitative methods uh -huh. and I called operational research and so forth. And I, I, I finished my master's in nine months, and uh, I came in the joined then a company called Pete Morick Mitchell. Oh, now, yeah. now it is called KPMG. And uh, the fellow I was uh, helping, uh, he, he, he was a manager from Pete Morick Mitchell who had come to study, but poor fellow could not understand statistics. Eventually he ended up getting PhD, but I have started 
mentoring him, telling him how to learn statistics. And uh, I had a simple method. I told him, you like women? And he says, yes. I said, well, tomorrow I want you to go and tell me what you think about the, the size of the bust and the waist and the buttocks. You know, what is it? It's 42, 43, 135. And so then I said, what do you think the average was? <laughs> and what was the range? Mm -hmm. So that's how we started learning yeah, and, okay. <laughs> and he, he never forgot that too. So he went back to the people Marvick Mitchell. He said, if you've got to hire one guy, you've got to hire this guy. Really? Yeah. Okay. Now, let me just step back. But you already had an MBA in India. Yeah, but I was doing a lot more of uh, quantitative operations research. I see. And that's what, what RPI had that they didn't yeah, have in right, India. The management yeah. science. I got actually a and degree in management this science. This is just when operations research and just all that quantitative up. stuff was coming in. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was phenomenal. And uh, so... And then I went through Pete Marwick Mitchell, and uh, I had a just commercial experience. I had MBA, I had management science, so it it was fitting my way of trying many different things. So I was called upon to go to many different places. And and where were you based? I was then came uh, to Boston. I see. Uh, we were living in Lenox Hotel, which still is there. And uh, we have an office was in Prudential Center, so I would just walk. And is that when you uh, came to Lexington? Yeah, no, after that we went through uh, uh, Watertown and Waltham. And I came to Lexington in 1973. Oh, okay. So, 66 is when I came to this country. But those seven, I was, we were not sure whether we were going to stay here forever. But in 73, I was made a partner, which was the shortest time anybody had been made partner there. And, uh, and I was the first Indian to become a partner in that big firm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when I made a partner, I said, now I think it's time we should settle. And we were renting a home in, in Waltham uh, near uh, Bentley College. So. Uh, we were looking around and we we looked and a couple of days here, Western and other places. I didn't like Western because my wife said, you travel so much, five days a week and consulting job. And I look around, I can't see my neighbors. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And uh, our agent here in Lexington had shown us houses, but we were not happy with anything anyway. In the end, at 7 o'clock, he calls. He says, I'm not the broker for this house. The house is not listed, but uh, it is selling by owner. So if you want to come, we both approach him. So we came at 7 o'clock, and by 8 o'clock, we made the deal. And that's how I came to Lexington. My kids were a five-year-old, the older daughter, and then the other one was born in that house. And this is on Nickerson Road. Yeah, eight Nickerson Road. We've still been there for ever since. And uh, we added on to the house. And uh, it has been a uh, wonderful experience. We, we came because we needed a house, and I decided to buy a house. And the community that I was looking at had good education in general. Right. So that wasn't a differentiating factor. The differentiating factor was the neighborhood mm -hmm. because we, we liked the neighborhood and, uh, and then uh, I remember, I tell you, I can never forget how friendly the neighbors were. And, uh, uh, in 1978, I left partnership, 77, I left the partnership after four years, because I wanted to do business. And the, the idea was that India's labor is so cheap, and why can't we manufacture products, items there? And I, by then I knew all the 
companies here because I was consulting with them. And uh, so, and they trusted me and I, I told them, uh, look, I'm going to come to your place. I look at your components. I have enough engineering sense to know that which one of them have a lot of labor. You know, uh, for example, if you go to uh, Ode Boats was one of our customers, and they have all these chrome-plated cleats. Mm -hmm. and they were chrome-plated that you cannot do chrome-plating without polishing and casting. A lot of labor in there. I said, I can save you 25% and I will save, earn 25% if that works for you, it work for me, and I'll get this part made in India and bring it here. So I, okay. So, All right. so me and my other, my brother-in-law, my wife's brother, together started this business. We called it for all the different reasons, which I won't go into, but we call it Minuteman International. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the international, so that's how internet, Minuteman International was born. And we started the thing from the home. And uh, so we had uh, uh, my business detour in terms of how we grew is a different story from the other day. But uh, one part of the story is very important. And that is uh, we had a friend, Mansfield Store Shop. And, and Wood Store was a big craze in those days. Mm -hmm. in the late 70s because of the internet. That's right. That's right. People were bringing a wood stove at home. Yeah. So what happened is uh, uh, I, somebody said, get me a cast iron kettle because on the wood stove we are putting in a normal copper kettle and the water is gone and anneals and warps. So get me a cast iron kettle. That's what they used to do in old, old days. And we can't get a cast iron kettle. It comes from Japan. It's far too expensive. I said, okay. So I took a sample and I took it to India to get the cast iron kettle made. I can't go to big established foundries because my volume wasn't there. I was small. He had given me an order of 50 kettles and uh, I decided to order 500 kettles, hoping the rest I can sell somewhere else. And, uh, uh, but there were a lot of problems in manufacturing it. It was a very thin metal, a lot of surface. So when they pour the metal, it doesn't fully get distributed. There's a cold shut and there's a leakage. So 60% of the kettles were getting leakage. Mm -hmm. In any case, I got my container, but it came instead of coming in the month of October, it came in the month of next May. Oh, oh, oh. So here I was in the middle of <laughs> summer, part of. What am I going to do with this kettle? He honored, he took 50 kettles. I didn't know what to do. I went in and uh, the Yellow Pages found all the 150 wood store shops that, that many were there in Massachusetts. I sent them a flyer, uh, kettle, 39.95, 40% off. For the dealer. They went. At the end of within 15 days, I didn't have to go to anybody. Everybody came and took away my kettles. Really? Yeah, they paid me for it. And I said, I must be on to something. And so I started going and visiting with them. And I visited with them and said, well, Can you give us a glove, a glove, a leather glove? Because we can't really reach inside. And, uh, so I made leather gloves which lined and uh, uh, cut. And then someplace I went and uh, they said, we want, you know, these are beautiful carpets and the wood store is here and sparks are coming out. Can I get a fireproof carpet in front of it? Uh, in those days, the only fireproof was that uh, ugly, uh, you know, ugly looking green uh, oh. fiberglass thing. Yeah. And they didn't want that in the places where the food stores were. Oh, I went into all kinds of research to find out uh, that uh, Belgium was the best place to make these beautiful looking carpets, uh, jacquard carpets, and uh, there was a research done in Eckley, England, 
that would uh, fireproof them. And uh, so I combined both of them and, and I finally brought the, the, the uh, half round mm -hmm. carpet. I didn't know how to design and there's a big story on how I lucked out. I had written to all of them that about 50 manufacturers that I'm coming, I would like to meet with you for this kind of a carpet, a half round carpet and a small rectangular carpet. Now I didn't realize that their looms are set up to be so big. Mm -hmm. The carpets are coming out, they, you know, they do the aging and then they do the fringes and they're rolled up and gone. And my stuff has to come out and they have to cut it like that. They have to have say, extra people in the sewing machines, mm -hmm. <laughs> which nobody was interested in. I didn't know French. I was in the uh, Cotrique region. And last day, a guy finally shows up and says, I want to talk to you because they wanted some connection with America. They wanted any way to go to export something to America, so they thought this is a guy who comes from America. Maybe we can succeed by helping him. Mm -hmm. So that's how we, and then he took me a design firm. The design firm had 100 men working for him in designing. And he says, okay, I'll tell you tomorrow what kind of design. He says, in the history of the world, nobody has ever designed an oriental carpet, which is half round and two feet back. Really? <laughs> Yeah. So he designed it. And we I flew samples over, we went to the show, and my God, there was a long queue. Everybody wanted that. And we, that was a big break for us. So, we so, so what you were doing, you, were, you, you weren't making the stoves, you were making the... Accessories. Accessories. Which yeah. nobody was making. Yeah. And right. Uh, Nobody was making them, everybody was interested in the big dollars. And uh, so that was a big break and that's how the business grew. But I used to get containers coming to 8 Nickerson Road. And Weinstein, the next door neighbor, and Adler, the next door neighbor, they were so nice. They never ever said, hey, this is too much. Yeah. And the containers are coming on the street. They encouraged me and they were very helpful. Because I moved out of there in two years' time, and uh, because we outgrew, and we went to Fitchburg because we couldn't find anything nearby, which was cheap enough space. And uh, the rest of history, we became a um, big fish in a small pond, and, uh, and then I finally sold my business to my brother-in-law. But you never made stoves. No, we never made stoves. Yeah, okay. And then the whole stove business kind of... Died, and then we went into fireplace. Yeah. So we made fireplace accessories, and uh, we, we had a lot of fun. You know, my stories are going all over the world. The leather, finally we, I ended up with uh, Brazil, because that's the leather is native there. It's yeah. But cheaper than in India, and India imports quite a bit of it. And uh, the kettles they could not make there because the volume was so high and the small foundries could not. Yeah. I had to go to Brazil for that too. Uh, and, uh, then we went to Taiwan, China, Poland, all the other places and uh, we, did, we did good. And uh, I finally retired from there in 1995. I sold my business to my brother-in-law. And he had done, done very well, he expanded a lot. And, uh, we are still very good with each other. It's still going. That's still going. Yeah, it's going very well. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, and then so you you stopped doing that in 1995, and then what? So then what happened is uh, this is another story, it's, uh, which is not so much related to Lexington, but it's interesting. I was very interested in internet. You know, all this thinking and internet had just started in 95 and first Mozilla uh, um, browser had just mm -hmm. invented. So I left that and we, my daughter 
Sangeeta, who is now a professor at MIT in bioengineering. She, her friend, myself, my other daughter, Sujata, who now is in London, she's a vice president in American Express. So we were all there in Boston. My 26th January was my birthday, is also a Republic Day for India. We were there and so they said, Dad, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. You, uh, but so there was a new, new uh, uh, restaurant called The Road Trip. So it, the idea was that you start in uh, America, go from north, east, south, west, center, to the road trip, and there are different kind of cuisine for each area that they mm -hmm. were serving. And in front of that was a big um, a bar, nice bar, and an open kitchen, and then there was a dining area. So you're sitting there, and it's around 8 o'clock, and I at 30, and I start seeing the bar area getting crowded. So I asked my daughter, Sangeeta, why are so many people standing there, young people? He said, Dad, that's a meat market. <laughs> that's how young people meet. Uh -huh. <laughs> she meant meat market, M-E-A-T, but <laughs> because that's what meat market is. And uh, I said, well, how do you Indians meet? Because uh, yeah, very few Indians. And I said, we don't know. I said, what if I started a business and show you a way of uh, meeting singles Indians on internet? She said, that's a good idea, she said. <laughs> And I started, that thing led to something, and I started suitablematch.com. There was a company called match.com just before right, that. Right, right. We were the second company, matchmaking. And I started that again from my home. And uh, uh, we, but it was difficult to find out how to reach Indians to tell them that we have this service. Internet was not that common. And mm -hmm. people didn't want to go on internet. They felt, oh, they felt that we are losers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So, anyway, that I expanded. Marketing was a big challenge. I succeeded. We had 5,000 registered Indians. Did you? Yeah, because the biggest problem was that, you know, the South Indians. Uh, want to meet South Indians, North Indians want to meet oh, North oh, Indians, okay. Bengali wants Bengali, you know, uh, Punjabi wants Punjabi, and Malayalam wants Malayalam, so there are 26 languages and you couldn't find enough, so we needed a larger database and I, we succeeded, we were doing 10, 12 marriages a month. Really? Yeah, it was just wonderful and I sold that in 2000 and to another Indian who then took it to Delhi. Does it still work? No, he left there and he got into oil business. His father had an oil business. Yeah. So it doesn't exist? Anymore. It exists, but I don't think it really does well because there are so many more now in yeah. India itself. Yeah. But we were pioneers in that field. Uh, but coming back to the, the town, uh, the during that time, we, Betty Edison and John Edison lived on our street. Right. And John Edison was running for the selectman for the first time. So he had come and knocked on my door. And uh, John, as you know, had been to India and right. in his development work. And uh, he, uh, I had a coffee for him. He said, I'm running for selectman. And I said, okay, I can, how can I help you? He said, maybe you can have a coffee with you, Indian friends of yours. Yeah, now, um, was there a, a fairly large Indian community? No, no, I don't know, when was the first time he ran? He, he ran in the 80s, I don't know. When he, I can't remember. Yeah, but fairly early. And, uh, so, it wasn't in the 90s, I think it was in the 80s that he ran for the selectman. And uh, so I, I got about my room, living room, about 15 Indian, you know. So, so when you moved here, there were 
there were we were uh, there were very few people who had bought a house before we bought. Some were renting, but we had a meeting. I we I went around and found about thirty five. Families. There were. When you moved here, there were about 35 families. Yeah, I'm going to say 35 families. I call everybody and I had 35 people in my home. So I don't know whether there were 35 families or 25, right. 30, but in that range. Right. And now we have over 350, 400 families. And uh, uh, it has become a big story in itself because. Uh, what is happening now, if you go to the school enrollment, you will find the highest percentage is people of Chinese origin. Right. The next highest is people of Indian origin. So what, what percentage of, of uh, roughly of youngsters in the schools of Indian origin now? Okay, so the total enrollment of Asians is about 33 percent. Right. And of that, the, I think, uh, almost uh, 45 percent is Chinese. And about 25, 30 percent is Indians. That high. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and why? They come for very simple reasons. And that is education. Mm -hmm. it, there are people from India who came to this country, and there's a big story, story about it. They go back to John F. Kennedy. He changed the immigration laws so that the people could come on merit. Mm -hmm. Before there used to be quotas of Europe, uh, so much. Uh, China was not allowed. The right, corridor right. not allowed before 65. So he changed the thing and we were the first batch to come and we had education. Right. So we had people who were engineers, who were doctors, mainly those and scientists. They were the batch they came. And as they came and as they went ahead in their own professions here and they had children, they wanted to go where their education. Right. And uh, so they were spread all over the country, but now a lot of them are in Northeast, particularly in this area because of high technology and uh, life sciences and so forth. So they get jobs here, they want to come here to live. And they look around for the same reason, there's good neighborhoods and location is good and education is good. Mm -hmm. And they're obviously more affordable than Western, Right. And uh, so that's why they're coming. And now what is happening, their friends are here, so they say, our friend lives there, let me go there. Because now right. they're, they're right. calling each other. So it's right. boomeranging, actually. Now, uh, this, this uh, community did uh, live all over town. I mean, they're not clustered. No, no, no. They they're, clustered? they're all over town. Yeah. All over town. Except now if you went to Avalon, housing. Yeah. Avalon has got about, I think, 35, 40 Indian families. Really? Because they are renting. They can't, oh, they can't afford to buy. Right. But they want to, you know, educate their children. Right. So education is a big thing in our community. And the uh, and next big thing is the culture. Uh, what was missing was that they were, they still are not as much involved in the town. So way back, Dinesh Patel and I started an organization called Indian American Forum for Political Education. The whole purpose was to tell Indians to get involved in the local politics in the town and the politics. Now what, you got involved pretty early when you got here, didn't you? Yeah, it's primarily because John Edison, after the, he won, he won by eight votes, by the way, and uh, 
so everybody who had a coffee has the claim on the <laughs> victory, and we had a claim too. John, but Jack Edison won by eight votes yes. the first time. Yeah. Out. Okay. So he came and... Uh, so that's how you got started, Yeah. was with Jack Edison's campaign. Exactly. So he came and he brought a list of uh, all the committees. He said, Narayan, can you tell me the committees that Indian community may be interested in? Right. And, uh, uh, and those days I was very busy running around with business. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't have the time to get involved directly. But... Uh, uh, I tell you, he was a good mentor to get involved. Uh, I remember um, you calling me then to get involved in uh, LEF. Right. We were the founding directors. That's of right, the Lexington Education Foundation. Yeah, and that was, I, it appealed to me because it was based on the idea that innovation sh should be funded and rewarded and we should raise money and in the school we should uh, we should help them with innovative ideas mm -hmm. and uh, that appealed to me that's how I joined there we I remember you know, going down and writing constitution and the whole thing and now of course LEF is a big institution in town yeah. and, and, uh, 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 and then uh, uh, Betty Edison um, was on the library. Uh, she called me, she says, uh, can you join the library foundation? Because uh, actually even before that, before that there was this campaign for 21st century. Right. And I started with that. She was on that, I started with that and then continued into the foundation. And that was uh, another big story because I felt that Indian community is not coming forward to donate enough money. So I went and had a special program to involve every Indian ethnic, sub-ethnic group, Bengalis, Punjabis, Sindhis, uh, you know, all the different communities of India. And uh, I went to then Kushbu. Kushbu is no longer there. Yeah. Kushbu had just come, and he was a, he was a Sikh. I I told him, uh, this is what I am doing. Uh, can you help? Uh, Who is that, Sonny? Yeah. Yeah. So he he said, uh, uh, I was looking for a thousand dollar from businesses. Uh, he said, well, I can't afford thousand dollars, but. I tell you what, you have a meeting here and I'll give you a free lunch. So, mm -hmm. so I had a free lunch, everybody came. And I told them, okay guys, you invite your friends, I will come and pitch. And uh, we collected, uh, I think in the month the program, uh, campaign was over, and I collected $60,000. Wow. And uh, we donated that to the foundation and we bought the naming rights for the atrium, the new book collection area. Mm -hmm. And it is named after Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And the very nice plaque, it says, uh, and it says, live as if you are going to die tomorrow and learn as if you are going to live forever. Oh, that's great. That's no. And uh, now, was it before then that you that you raised the money to build up the Indian collection at the library? Because I remember that there was there was one bef much before that. Uh, remember, the library had a director before. Uh, I think Roberts was the name. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first came to the town, I went and looked at the library. There were totally 12 books on India, and four of them were CIA briefings. I said, Geez, that doesn't make any sense, we are a big country. So I went to him and he said, look Narayan, we don't have the funds to start collecting so many books on India. I said, what if I raise the funds for you? 
She will help. So I established a trust called Indian American Library Trust. And that's, we started that. We started with $15,000. We collected. I collected again $15,000 like that from Indian community. And now it's about 30000 And the interest from that, I think maybe more than 50000 And the interest from that by collections on India. Yeah. On Indian subcontinent. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, then I would bring, uh, you know, when we have, because we were a political organization, Government of India, Consul General and Ambassador always wanted to connect with us. So they would come and I'll take them to the library and, mm -hmm. and got a lot of collections of their cultural collection for the library. I brought them to the library, nice big huge books. And uh, so, uh, but I was always concerned and I still am concerned that Indian Americans uh, find they're busy in their own family life and uh, they are not getting that much involved in the town. But now that is changing. Now that is changing. Uh, now let me ask you, we were talking with Sophia and, and she said that the, uh, the Chinese culture is such that, as I remember, that, that you just don't get involved in things. And so that it's taken her quite a long time to develop in the Chinese community in Lexington a, a sense of participation and involvement and contribution. It, is the, no, I would say it's partially true. Indian culture, politics is considered dirty mm -hmm. because it's very corrupt from the first vote onwards, all the way up to the... And people think that if you are going to be a good professional, politics is not the place for you. So people who go to the politics are people generally not very educated. And uh, that has been the history that also has changed. And not successful in their professions, yeah. so they do politics. Yeah, they do politics. and. Uh, they, mm -hmm. because uh, the, the nature of politics is uh, vote gathering and going and vote buying and uh, getting promised some re something in return, in India at least, this, that has been the case. Now it is changing, it changed a lot. Uh, but uh, community involvement is a lot in India. Okay. You are always involved in community to help in whatever form you can. So, so involvement in the library, that's, that's okay in, in, in the yeah. involvement in the LEF, that's, that's okay. Yeah. But running for town meeting, that's... that's yeah, they don't, they, I don't know. <laughs> this, uh, town meeting, uh, I ran for town meeting. You know, the other person who helped me was Mark, uh, Mark Batten. So uh -huh. she came to one of these uh, uh, coffees for somebody. I don't know who she came for. She found out my background. Then after a week or two, she called me. She said, I have got an opening on Capital Expenditures Committee. Would you like to join? And I waited and I joined. I was there for six years. And that's how I got involved in the town. Mm -hmm. And that's when I... Uh, were you on capital expenditures before you were a town meeting member? Yes. Uh -huh. and, uh, okay. and then uh, then I think uh, I, I didn't really run for town meeting. Margaret Kopi and John Rosenberg, they put me as a right in. For oh, really? Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> so then I, I, I just... Came in because it was a vacancy of some kind, and uh, I, you know, I, I enjoyed. I generally enjoy the idea of uh, contributing to a common effort, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I learned a lot about the town from town meeting. And, uh, it really is a remarkable institution, 
uh, if you are outside of it, you don't really have a chance of knowing right. how, how the town is run. Right. At times it is frustrating because you think you don't count, <laughs> yeah. but something yeah. really does happen in the, over the period of time. So when I got into town meeting, we started uh, this uh, uh, Indian American political organization. I was involved in a, a library and LEF, uh, uh, and, and then uh, other thing happened. Uh, uh, after I sold my my business of suitable match, I wanted to start another business that was to roll up small non small uh, uh, insurance agencies. So buy one in Lexington, one in Wellesley, one in Bedford, one bring like twenty five of them under one umbrella and do c combined marketing for them and. Mm -hmm. uh, get bigger volume, get bigger commissions from the travelers and other people, the carriers. Mm -hmm. It was a great business model. Uh, I needed $25 million and it will become $300 million in five years. And uh, I had, as a partner in crime, a guy, was executive uh, vice president of the, one of the largest brokerage firms in the country. He, he was on a sabbatical and he came and this is another story. Uh, we started we started the business together, and uh, on 9/11, the famous 9/11, he calls me. He says, Narayan, I cannot come today. I, he was on a way from Connecticut. He used to live in Connecticut because I heard something about the World Towers being hit by the planes, and 200 of my colleagues are there, and they all died, needless to say, and later on he says, I can't continue with this business. Mm. So I left that, and then I said, what am I going to do now? That's when I focus more, even more to the town, and, uh, because I didn't want to travel too much. So I thought about non-profit sector, and that's how my involvement in non-profit comes. I said, you know, I want, I've been a consultant for many years and I want to help people. I can do some consulting with nonprofit organizations. And uh, so that's one. And the more I researched, I found there are over 180 501c3 registered nonprofit organizations in Lexington. Yeah, I bet. And most of them are small. If I put quarter million dollars as in Lexington as a limit, 80% will come below that. Oh, yeah. And uh, I said, they don't have money to pay me for consulting. When I left <laughs> Pete Marvick Mitchell, my consulting price was 400 bucks an yeah. hour, yeah. 300 yeah. bucks an hour. So even if I get 200, I'll be lucky here. And uh, so then we've decided to start a organization called Nonprofit Net. We still exist now. Ten years ago we started and it does very well. We bring all the nonprofits together and we teach them how to succeed and we do it free. And we meet in the library once a month and it's been a phenomenal success and we continue to do that. I'm now a chairman emeritus of that and I've got a group of directors mm -hmm. who are doing, doing that. So non-profit net was another endeavor that has really helped a lot of non-profits in Lexington. Mm -hmm. There's a non-profit here, they say, we, we should go with Narayan's seminars. We bring all the best experts on fundraising, board development, and uh, volunteer management, use of technology, and appeals letters, everything related to as, during that time, I also got involved in religion because uh, the fellow named Ed Kellogg, he was a member of the Lexington Interfaith Clergy Association. Oh, yeah. And he met me. He was, he was the uh, priest of uh, Latter-day Saints. And uh, you might remember him, Francine, yeah. And uh, 
So he said, Narayan, let me, are you are a Hindu, we don't have a Hindu clergy in our association. I said, but Hindus don't have a clergy. He said, that's all the more better, why don't you join us? So I ever since been involved with the clergy association. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. I have a great fortune to visit with every congregation, every church, every synagogue, mm-hmm. meet all of them. A lot of turnover among the ministers and priests. And, uh, but I have seen the different side of Lexington. The, yeah. the charitable side of Lexington, the service side of Lexington, mm-hmm. and, uh, and growth and decline of certain churches. Some churches have grown so much, you know, Grace Chapel comes to mind, mm-hmm. and others are merging like Sacred Heart and uh, yeah. uh, St. Bridges. St. Bridges. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, different things. Peter Meeks was there for a long time. Mm-hmm. He got replaced. I saw a lot of turnover of uh, the uh, priest. And uh, so I saw, finally, I, so I got involved in the town from many different... Well, exactly. Now, what, um, what is your effort now? What is your goal now as far as the Indian community is concerned and, and uh, involving, involving them? They are involved in education, they are involved in the library. Uh, you trying to get more into yes. the town meeting? Or? Yes, so here is what my goal is. And uh, the goal is to have at least about 10 town meeting members. The goal is that community at large should know more about Indian culture Mm -hmm. because we have a lot of different things to offer. You know, the Hindu mind, the yoga, our art form of dancing and the music, they're very different than the rest of the Western world. And our goal is for them to know that. Uh, The goal is for also the departments, town departments like police and fire particularly, who are the first responders to understand the culture of Indians. For example, if you come through the door as a police responder and uh, there, uh, there is a, a call for domestic abuse, the police will come and take the wife away and husband away and start interviewing them. But if they did that in an Indian home, the wife won't speak because they defer it to the husband. Uh-huh. It's a cultural thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, they take their shoes and go all over and there's an area which is our temple. We, we take off our shoes before we go there. And mm-hmm. uh, so we had a session with police on helping them understand our culture, mm-hmm. invite them to our festivals. So uh, helping the people to understand our culture I, is another goal. The, the goal also is that uh, the Indian community volunteer itself into many different opportunities that right. are in the town. And uh, so what am I doing uh, with respect to the uh, town meeting membership, increasing the candidates there? I'm going to have a meeting of 10, 15 Indians potentially who could be running for it and invite people and show them that look, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, this is much work is involved and let them get a feeling of it, we'll help you in running for it. So we'll start that effort in another few years time, we'll get more of that. I spent time with uh, Lex Media to tell uh, uh, DeSanto, Florence DeSanto, director there, that, uh, look, there's a lot of community festivals going on, activities going on, which you are not filming, Mm -hmm. that you should film, and because people would love to see that. So I started that about five months ago, and it started working. I can see 
she is doing that now. Credit to her, uh, Lex Media. So they are filming our dances and our other things, which other people can see. The cultural integration is very important. And also, after the school superintendent, which we are doing now, to have a meeting of Chinese, Indians, Koreans, and social studies uh, um, heads, and the, and the principal and assistant superintendent on international culture education. We have the two largest blocks in the world, China and India, very well represented in town, and yet there is not much cultural discrimination right. among the students that they should do. Mm -hmm. So after a year of work, they finally have agreed to take a look at it, how we can do it. Mm -hmm. So that the students, when they come out of here, our school system, they are actually well aware of the international cultures. Mm -hmm. That's where they will be posted to do the work. All the work is not done in America anymore. It's mm -hmm. done all over the world. So those are the areas where I have we're working. How are you coming on the effort to get uh, ten people of Indian origin into town meeting? Well, I had asked Satwik, you know, he ran for a selectman, to, uh, while I was gone to London for about a month, to arrange a meeting of the people, go and find out. He knew some people, but he's gotten busy with some other gubernatorial campaign. Mm -hmm. But I, my plan is to have a meeting and get him going. And uh, we'll do it uh, sometime during summer, I'll have a meeting. And, uh, yeah, good. I know that these things take time. Yeah. One at a time you have to go. Well, you've got one. Yeah. Vinesh Patel came and uh, other one uh, lost only by 21 votes from the same precinct, Deepika Lalwani. She's very good. And she's involved in PTA. And, uh, IAA, Indian Americans of Lexington, is another institution now, which uh, I founded, co-founded that. And uh, that is helping people to come together and work for the volunteers. I must say, man, Dinesh, he's a pretty distinguished fellow. Yeah, Dinesh Patel, he is, uh, uh, I think, the longest serving surgeon in MGH. And and he's he's head of some. He's a, he's head of uh, arthroscopic surgery, and he actually specializes in knees. And he invented all the instruments that go there nowadays. That arthroscopic surgery that they have given a uh, training area building named after the Nish Patel in Mass General Hospital. So, so professionally, he's very renowned, and and he is uh, he is really uh, active in the town meeting. He he's not holding back. Yes, he, yes, I I think it's wonderful. I think it is it's great. He he consults me for different things, and uh, yeah. but he has his own mind, and he he pushes. So he and you are great role models for that. Oh, yeah, we have been the community. oldest friends in Lexington. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, but I, I think uh, time has come that this community should, the powers that be, should reach out to also Indian community, just as my involvement came because of people reaching out to me. You reached out to me, March Batten reached out to me, Jack Edison reached out to me, Betty Edison reached out to me. And a little bit of reaching out, little bit of reaching out will bring them forward. Mm -hmm. On their own, there's a big threshold which is difficult to cross. Okay. Well, I think that's a very important point that, that, that you make, that uh, um, it isn't just up to the Indian community to become involved, it's up to the leadership in the town to to reach out and to solicit participation because you have so much to contribute and uh, 
I hope that uh, people watching this program will uh, will uh, hear what you're saying and and respond to it. Thanks ever so much. This has been wonderful. Well, thank you, and I appreciate you taking the time. And I can say it again, that in my own case, without being nudged by the powers that be, the leadership, I would not have been involved in the town as much as I have been involved. It really goes to those people who helped come out. And, uh, thank you very much.